So let me first stop my screen. Let me see if this works. Should be showing, I think. Uh, oh, let yep. me give you yes. slides. Okay, give me a sec. So I think uh, the slide deck is showing with your uh, cool logo. So uh, hello and uh, welcome everyone. Uh, first of all, thanks for joining. And like I already said, uh, Michael and myself are going to talk about uh, one of our favorite services featured in Azure today, uh, namely Azure Bastion. Like you can see on the screen, our session is titled Azure Bastion. One does not still simply walk into my VNet. Um, it's a version two of an older session. Michael and myself delivered for the last time. I think it was somewhere in the beginning of last year. But in the meantime, um, Bastion has a lot of new features, and that's why we created this uh, version two of this session. And really, really hope that by the end of the session, everyone who's not yet using Azure Bastion will start using it. Um, before we start, we want to thank everyone of the Cloud Friday Meetup for setting up this event, uh, and of course, for uh, allowing us to deliver this talk. Um, on the agenda today, the things we're talking about. Uh, first of all, we will look here at the common um, VM administrative access method, um, the different ways, um, the good and the bad ones, on um, how you can connect to your Azure EAS VM um, before or next to Azure Bastion. Um, then we will talk about what Azure Bastion is and dig a little bit deeper in how you can deploy it, uh, configure it, um, automate it, and of course use it. And before closing off, we hope we still have some time for a Q&A where we will love to answer any of your questions or yeah, we can simply leave it to Gandalf maybe. Uh, we will see. Um, before we start, let us also shortly introduce ourselves for the people who don't know us. Um, so my name is Wima Thessen. Um, just like Micha, I live in Belgium uh, where I work as an Azure Technical Advisor for a company called Proximus. Um, Community-wise, I'm a founding board member of a Belgium user group called MC2MC, um, where we mainly focus on Azure and Microsoft 365, but we also keep an eye on security, Hyper-V, and I think these days almost a complete Windows Server landscape. Next to that, I also have my own blog, Um I'm also a Microsoft uh, Azure MVP, and like most IT professionals these days, I think. I'm also on Twitter and LinkedIn. So if you ever want to reach out or you have a question related to Azure Bastion, for example, um, you can always contact me through my Twitter handle at Wematersen, or yeah, I think you can even simply scan the QR code on the right side of the screen, I think it is. And I think with that, Micha, you can uh, introduce yourself, I think. Yes, uh, so my name is Micha Wetz. I'm a freelancer um, in Belgium. Uh, I work at Connection, which is a Belgium CSP. Um, awesome to do um, a lot of customer interactions and deployments. As Wim said, um, proud member of the MC2MC uh, user group, but also the Techline user group, so I'm in two. Um, and we also invite a lot of speakers. So if you want to deliver a session, always um, Submit it to our call for speaker page. It's it's always nice to see other people speaking about their favorite topic. Talking about favorite topic, my favorite Azure subject uh, still remains, even though Bastion is a great service. My favorite service is still Azure Virtual Desktop. Uh, <laughs> um, that's how I became MVP uh, for Microsoft. Um, so if you have questions regarding Azure Virtual Desktop, do not hesitate to contact Wim. And <laughs> no, just kidding. Uh, if you have questions, don't hesitate, just contact me. Um, also, you have my Twitter and my blog. I don't do a lot of blogging, I do a lot of speaking and, and things like that. But if you have questions, do not hesitate to contact us. And I think we had another chat about ourselves. Let's talk about question. Yeah. So, like Micha said, with that all being said, I think uh, we can now focus on our first topic, uh, where we'll look into the most common VM administrative access method. So, as most of you will know, the easiest way, but um, also the least secure one to connect to an Azure VM is through the use of a public IP address, uh, a PIP. 
Um, in this way, you can, act, you can connect to the VM through RDP or SSH, depending if the VM is a Windows or a Linux VM. Um, you just need to associate a new or even an existing PIP to your VM's network interface. And in the case you have an associated network security group or shortly set an NSG um, to the subnet used by the VM, you just open the specific ports with an inbound rule like one that allows 3389 or, or if you're using a, a Linux which allows uh, port 22. But let us say this way of connecting is okay when you are studying for an Azure exam and you need to do a lot of things um, or you need to test out some things or you write a blog uh, in your own personal environment, um, but you should never. Um, I think Michael and myself can't repeat this enough. Use it in any Azure production or even development or QI environment um, to connect any of your business criticals or even uh, test frames because one of one or both of those management ports will be widely open to the internet and in this way um, your vm can easily be attacked and breached by hackers script kiddies or like you can see on the screen even by orcs so next to the use of the pip uh, another way to connect to your azure EAS vms um, is by placing them behind an azure external load balancer um, instead of the vm um, the load balancer then uses the PIP. Um, but in Micha's and my opinion, yeah, it's kind of security through obscurity, like they say, because uh, one, or mo uh, one or both management ports will be still open to the internet. Um, only now there's an external load balancer in front. So again, uh, not really a secure method to connect to any of your EAS VMs in a production, pre-prod or a QI environment. Um, and this because, yeah, as already said, uh, attackers mostly uh, target those management ports on those internet facing VMs. Um, they mostly do this with port scans, uh, brute force attacks or DDoS attacks. Uh, and in case of, for example, a successful brute force attack, an attacker can easily compromise the VM and in this way establish a foothold into your environment um, from where they can then do whatever they want to do. And trust us, this happens a lot. And we see that a lot of companies who assist or uh, we help or where we design stuff and we need to integrate it in an existing environment. Most of the time we see some VMs um, being breached because they are or widely opened to the internet through a PIP or yeah, and everything is open. Um, and even to make it even more clear, if you have one uh, one or both management ports open uh, via an inbound a rule uh, in an associated NSG where your VMs live in, so maybe you have a VM subnet and you have some VMs in there, and on that VM subnet you associate an NSG like the one showing on the screen. Um, if you open then that NSG, you will see that the name field uh, in, in the name, the name will pre be preceded by an orange uh, hazard triangle with an exclamation mark inside it. And by this, Microsoft is telling you that there is a huge security risk by opening these ports uh, to the internet. So once again, really a bad idea to do this in any of your company or uh, customer Azure environments. But then, of course, uh, the question we all need to ask ourselves is how can we then securely connect to an EAS VM? Um, well, first of all, by using a site-to-site -site VPN or an express route. Um, in this way, you connect from your on-premises network uh, through a secure tunnel to the private IP address of the VM. So the VM doesn't need a PIP anymore. You just go through the tunnel and you yeah, hit it through um, yeah, the original name or through uh, its private IP address. Um, next to the, those two options, you can, for example, also use a point to site VPN. Uh, we're seeing that a lot being used by developers working from home on their own laptop and they want to uh, configure or uh, yeah, do some deployments from over there. Yeah, do it in that way. Um, a point to site VM, um, yeah, like I already said, allows you to set up a secure connection from your own computer, for example. Um, to uh, VNet, uh, yeah, wherever your VMs are living. Um, and some companies are even using um, 
private ac uh, privilege access workstations or PAW, PAW if you require those. So uh, we also see that that some customers being installed, they have a PAW and through that PAW, um, they connect to their VMs uh, through a site to site or an express site, for example. Um, so dig a little bit deeper in the point to site uh, VPN connection story. Um, these days we have two options you can choose between. Um, first of all, you have a point to site VPN with certificate based authentication, uh, where you can even use a self signed certificate. Um, when you set it up, you just need to specify an address pool um, based in the 172 range. As tunnel type, you select then V2 and open VPN. And you set the authentication type, like you can see, on uh, to Azure certificate. Then after that, you upload the public key of the root certificate to Azure. Um, then on the client device, you first of all need to install the client certificate. Uh, and then secondly, you need to download the VPN client. Um, for example, if you download the client from a Windows device, uh, the executable will be underneath, uh, I think, Micha, it was a IMD for your folder in a zip package. And when you install it and everything is uh, yeah, successfully installed, you simply click connect. And by that way, um, if you ever want to set it up, um, I already wrote some blog posts um, about automating the whole point to site VPN setup uh, with the use of two Azure PowerShell scripts. So simply Azure PowerShell. Um, the QR codes and the links are shown on the slide, um, but I think we can also share them in the chat. That's maybe easier, but yeah, I will do it when uh, Michai is talking. Um, so next to the Azure certificate authentication, you can, for example, also use Radius. Um, I myself didn't see that being used a lot in companies. I don't think Micha saw it a lot, but yeah, probably some companies will use it. Um, but next to that radius, you can also, like you can now see on the screen, use Azure AD authentication with your point to site VPN. Um, it's a little bit different than when you use a certificate uh, authentication. Um, first of all, as the tunnel type, you need to um, select Open VPN SSL. You also need to uh, select Azure Active Directory as authentication type. Um, then you need to specify your tenant, um, your audience, and your issuer. And you also need to give admin consent for Azure VPN to be used as an enterprise application. And if you're using a Windows 11 device as a client device where you want to connect it, um, you once again download uh, the VPN package. In there is also an XML file. Then you go to the Microsoft Store and you simply uh, download the Azure VPN client. And that's easy. You install the Azure mm -hmm. VPN client, import the XML file, and you're ready to connect. So quite easy, a little bit different. First of all, you don't need to create any certificates or you need to buy any certificates. You can simply do it uh, by downloading the, the, the VPN package from um, the Microsoft Store, download, set up everything in Azure, download the VPN package, import the XML file in the Azure VPN client, and you're ready to connect. That's it. So, sorry to interrupt, Vim. I, yeah. I, so, I, I've actually, I just want to comment on using Azure AD as yeah. your authenticate provider or for uh, site point to site VPN. I've yeah. I've used this and what's really great about it is because it's Azure AD, you can have conditional access policies in front of yeah. it. So you can you request can put everything in place. Like, yeah. Um, you can you can even select which groups have access yeah. to the VPN client or users. So you like you've got full control over the VPN. And once you've set it up, you all you have to do is distribute that XML file to your users. Yeah. Um, they download the client, like you said, from the store. They import the XML it file. Intune, eh? You can download it, push yeah. it to Intune, and it's ready. So, like, it, it really makes it easy, and you've got all the control because you've got that conditional yeah. access policy, and you've got the the which users yeah. are. Um, I think I think if everything is configured on if if everything is configured correctly at the Azure side, yeah, it's it's. Of five minutes work to set it up. It's it's click click almost, and most of the times it works. 
if there are not some problems on the client device itself or the connection it's making. That's probably the things we're missing, but uh, I think we're already using this at some uh, of our customers. We have some developers and yeah, everybody's working from home and they want to develop some things and then mostly they do it this way. Mm. But yeah, I was if you're, I was if you're say testing people... out things in your own environment, yeah, you can do it with uh, self-signed certificates, but yeah, don't use it in a production environment. Eh? Then yeah. try to do it this way. If you do, if you use this to connect, eh? from a device. Mm. I, I was going to say, you know, the the other alternative, and you're probably going to show it, is the site-to-site -site VPN. But yeah. um, with everybody working from home now, like yeah. they're not. They first would have to have a VPN into the office and then go over that site-to-site -site VPN yep. to Azure. Now you can have point-to-site VPNs and have them secure and controlled with... Uh, well, most of the time it gives less latency and, and trouble issues because you don't need to go to the office first and then from the office to the site-to-site -site or the express site. Now you almost yeah, you use your own internet connection to yeah, make a connection to the Azure environment to do your thing. So I I love this. <laughs> Just yeah. saying. <laughs> and you can automize it to Intune. You can make a package and yeah, it's it's yeah. You can even put in the XML file. I think uh, probably some guys in our user group do it that way. They they bundle it and then they push it out and everything. It, it's it's there and it works like every other application they push push through Intune. So. If you have all those things in house, it's quite easy to uh, get it working from yeah your users' devices from home. So um, we also have another one. Uh, we already talked about some options, um, but I think Micha, some companies we work for and we see uh, that they're still using a jump box or jump post or yeah. Jump server, like some people like to name it. Uh, mostly, this jump box is a Windows EA server, uh, which is used to access and manage all other VMs in an environment, in an Azure environment. And you kind of jump to that VM, from that VM to the other VMs uh, to manage them. Um, a jump box, most of the time, still uses a PIP. Um, so, but there's a way to protect it where we're going to talk about directly. But um, we also want to mention is um, if you're still using a jump box uh, or you want to start using it, uh, also keep in mind it's a Windows Server VM in Azure. So it's another resource you need to keep updated. You need to back it up. And if it malfunctions, you need to troubleshoot it. And even when you want to foresee high availability, for example, you should at least have two jump boxes uh, deployed. So yeah, think about it. It's still an option, but yeah, you will see there are some better options these days. And if you're still using a jump box with that PIP um, and you try to connect to it, uh, a way to do it in a secure way, um, in, in a way to better protect it is through the use of um, just-in-time uh, VM access or JIT. Uh, for people who don't know JIT, um, JIT enables you to lock down your VMs at the network level by blocking inbound traffic to specific management ports like RDP or SSH. And in the meantime, limit the amount of time that those management ports are open. Um, I think the maximum is still 24 hours. Um, good to know is that JIT is Oh, uh, you should know that JIT is only available when you use Microsoft Defender for Cloud with the Microsoft for Server Plan 2 enabled. But I think with that being said, enough slides, maybe I show it in my Azure portal how it works. So let me see if I can connect. Uh, my Azure portal is showing, I think, at the moment. So first of all, go to the global search bar, type in Defender. I have a colorful mouse because in that way it's uh, more obvious to pinpoint things. Click on the Microsoft Defender for Cloud. Then you go completely to the bottom and click on Environment Settings on this one. You just click on it. Then you will see uh, your management group structure. So I have a lot of yeah, 
are following the enterprise scale model at the moment. So I have some management groups, and for example, I have one with sandboxes, and I have a test via subscription underneath there. You can see nothing is enabled at the moment. Um, just click on that specific subscription. Then on top, you have the defender plans. Click on that one. Um, you will see servers. You can see everything is off at the moment. Just click on on. That's it. You click on change plan. You see um, Microsoft Defender for Service Plan 2 is selected. And you just click on conform and everything will be enabled. If you do, if you want to enable it for all the resources available to Microsoft Defender for Cloud, you can also click on enable all. Um, if you, by the way, you want to do it in an automated way, there is a specific policy you can apply at your company group level, uh, management group, just apply that specific policy and all these things will be enabled for every new subscription placed under underneath any management group. So that's the easy way to do it. If you want to do it manually, you can do it like this. So that's the first thing you need to do. Then let me close. No, let me just click on save. I didn't click on it, I think. Yeah, it will take some time. OK, it's clear. Well, let me close this. Then underneath cloud security, you have uh, workload protections. Just click on that. Scroll down to the bottom. And over here, you have a just-in-time VM access. You can click on that. And you will see I already have JIT enabled for two VMs. Um, if you want to change the options, you can just click on Edit. Um, and you can add, for example, if it's a Linux VM, port 22. You can choose a protocol. You can do it per request, or you can even complete a complete range of IP addresses. And you can specify the amount of time. Uh, the default is three. Mostly, if I if companies want to use it and use it, I put it even to one hour. So, and if I use JIT, it's mostly uh, when a company doesn't have an Azure AD Premium P2 uh, where they can use PIM. So, if a company doesn't have a P2, um, I try to yeah put them use Microsoft Azure for Cloud, use JIT in a combination. Um, we can even use it with Bastion. We will talk about that a little bit later. So, and that's it. Let me close this one. And then if you want to connect to a VM, let me go to the global search bar, click on my virtual machines. You can see I have a jump box eh, with a pip. Let me show it. So you can see this specific VM, like you can see over here as a public IP address. Um, so it's a Windows VM. I just click on connect. I click on the RDP tab because it's Windows. And now you can see because it is enabled, this VM has a just in time access policy. You first of all click on the button request access. Just click on it. You will see something will open. It will say request approved. And then I can simply download the RDP file, open the file. Uh, let me put it over here. Connect. Um, it can take around two minutes be before JIT is completely in place. So probably if you first click on it that fast like I did, it probably won't work and then you need to try it again. But let me see if it's already working. No, let me try it again. So then I, I just want to check. Yeah. So so this is not Bastion. Uh, no, this, this is not JIT. The Bastion. This is just... Uh, yeah. A jump box with a, a VM with a pip on it, and yeah. I enabled JIT on Which, it. Okay, but a, a pip on a on a VM in the beginning, you said it's not a good way to do it. It's right? not a good way to do it, but some companies still use a jump box, and Microsoft implemented this to make it more secure because you can put a slot. Eh? The, the, by by default, there is no access to RDP, so the, there is an NG mm. on that specific subnet, so RDP isn't opened. The thing JIT does, it creates an inbound rule in your NSG, allowing RDP, and after the hour is passed or 24 hours, depending on the time you put in your JIT rule, um, that specific rule, inbound rule, is dropped. Uh, okay. And you can specify to a specific... So 
yeah, it's still open to the internet for a specific amount of time, time, but it's 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 limited. Eh? So it's not yeah. open all the time. Mm. So I guess, you know, you could do this manually or your admins could do this manually and go, OK, yeah. you need access to this VM. I'm going to open the ports for an hour. Uh, so yeah. I'm going to create an NSG rule and then I'm going to go after an hour and uh, remove that. It rule. Drops. But then, yeah, you know, it's, it's admins gone. get busy and they do yeah. other stuff and then they forget that that rule is there. And the next thing, a VM has got an NSG rule open to the public yeah. uh, that's been forgotten about. So yeah. this is a way of making sure that that rule is there temporarily and yeah. it's removed afterwards. And it's so maybe I, I can show that specific rule. So you see, mm -hmm. I'm now connecting to that VM on its public IP address. But I just, first of all, a hacker can't do it because he's not able to request that access. So you need to request access first of all. That access needs to be granted. So you need to be, uh, you have the specific roles in place that yeah, you're allowed to do it and request access. And then you can connect it. So the process is a little bit difficult than just yeah, put a pip on it and let it open. It's, 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 it's a process eh? because you first of all need to request access. So if I go to the NSG, let me see, is this one normally? If I go to the inbound security rules, uh, no, it's not that one. It's another one. Uh, let me see. I think it was this NSG. Yeah. So you see, there is a security center inbound rule at the moment in place. Mm, and it's got JIT there in it the name, so yeah. it tells you that it's it was yeah. created by some kind of JIT yeah. thing. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. It's it's always in that name. You you're not able to change the naming or whatever. You see, the name is like that. So it's a JIT rule. And it will be dropped in. Uh, I think I left the default for this one. So in three hours, it, I'm not able to pip anymore if I don't request access again. So it's a way to protect your yeah jump boxes if you're still using those. It's an extra layer of security you can put on it. But the nice trick is you can even combine JIT with Bastion, but I think uh, Michael will first tell us all about what Azure Bastion is, I think. Yes. So let, let me, me stop, stop sharing, Michael, maybe. Yes. Yeah, I'm gone. Floor is yours. So one of the things that I've noticed is if you're creating a virtual machine in the portal, one of the default things is pip. open yeah, RDP uh, yeah. I know. Um, and a pip. So you kind of have to be conscious of that and turn those off. Um, maybe one That's day. That's why, why we never deploy any default. VMs through uh, the portal anymore. Portal. We mm -hmm. always do it through automation. Um, yeah, we're using Azure PowerShell, um, Terraform, um, yeah, biceps these days. Mm -hmm. We just push it, and there's. We even have policies in place that don't allow the creation of a pip. That's almost every customer and we put it even on the company uh, management group level so then we the only um yeah subscriptions where we allow it is any in any test subscriptions underneath the sandbox management group and that's it and all the rest we don't allow it mm -hmm. so you can try to deploy a vm if if you have the specific rights to do so through the portal but yeah you can't create a pip that's the way you block it. It's it's quite easy. Yeah? As a, with every policy, you can do almost everything. I think these days, almost everything. <laughs> oh yeah, I said almost. Eh? <laughs> but yeah, it's 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 you you need to uh, get a complete story because there are a lot of options and you need to put a lot of features and resources in place to re really guardrail your environment. Mm -hmm. And this is one thing that can help if you have some resources being used in that way, like a jump box, for example. OK, let's jump into something else. <laughs> let's uh, talk about Azure Bastion. So what is Azure Bastion? Um, this is the definition from Microsoft. Um, so it, it describes it quite well. It's a path service, um, but let's see in uh, more detail what it is exactly. Most important thing is um, it's a path service, and as Wim and myself like to call it, it's a Jumbox as a service. 
uh, where it is provisioned inside your VNet. So you have your existing VNet and uh, Microsoft just deploys your Bastion service into it. It gives you a secure RDP or SSH connection to your virtual machines, and it is possible to do it from within the Azure portal. Um, you don't need any public IPs anymore to your virtual machines. Um, it's only ne necessary for your Bastion service, but your virtual machines can just remove all those public IP addresses. Um, it is completely agentless, so you don't need to change anything on your virtual machines. You don't need to install anything uh, on your VMs. It's just using the standard RDP or SSH connection to your virtual machines. So that's also always a nice thing. Um, inside Azure Bastion, uh, you will see uh, that it's a scale set. So the minimum is two um, scale units, if I'm not mistaken but you can scale up to quite a lot more depending on the resources that you require from the Bastion host. Um, it's also a great protection for your virtual machines because yeah, no public IPs anymore, so no more port scanning, no more Zegel days ex um, exploits, things like that. So it really protects your environment quite a lot. Um, at the beginning, um, there was only the basic SKU for Azure Bastion. Uh, which already has quite some um, features, which is, is great for most of the use cases uh, where you can simply connect to your virtual machines, uh, both Windows, Linux. Um, so using RDP SSH, it has audio, it has um, um, the clipboard redirection. So for most of the basic things, you can just use the basic SKU. If you want to use more advanced features, then you have to go to the standard SKU. Uh, where you can indeed scale out your uh, Azure Bastion hosts. So if you require more connections, you can simply scale it out. Um, also, you can connect from your local device. So if you don't want to use the Azure portal um, and you want to connect from your local device, you can scale to the standard SKU and connect to uh, your virtual machines using your local client. But we will dive into that later on as well. Um, also, a nice thing is to upload or download files. So if you want to really um, connect to the VM, like you would do um, using a PIP, or if you are uh, connected to your uh, site to site or point to site connection, and you want to upload files, download files, it is possible with the standard queue at the moment. So that's a nice feature as well. Um, and also a nice feature is um, you can disable the copy paste. Um, so if you want to enforce some policies or do some uh, advanced things, you have to go to the standard SKU as well. How does it work? Um, so you simply start with your VNet, you have your virtual machines, um, you deploy the Bastion host, uh, it's deployed inside your VNet. Um, you open up port 443 to the Bastion host. That's the only uh, 443 open connection that you require. Everything else can simply be closed only to the Bastion subnet. And from that point, you open up the NSD to your virtual machines. So on the Bastion host needs to be able to connect to your session host using 3389 or 22. And no more public IPs. So you can simply remove all those public IPs and only have one on your Bastion host. Um, at the beginning, uh, when Bastion came out, um, there was a, a small um, hiccup, <laughs> um, where, um, hiccup <laughs> where you had to deploy a Bastion host in each VNet. So even if you had VNet peering throughout your network, Bastion didn't support that VNet uh, peering yet. Luckily, at the moment, it is supported. So you can simply use VNet peering, and as um, most of the people already know, you can deploy a hub spoke model. Um, inside your hub, uh, you deploy your Bastion host, you do the VNet peering, and you can connect to all your VMs in each spoke from within your central Bastion host. So you only need one Bastion for your entire environment. And as Wim already um, said, 
You can even use the bastion to connect your to your on-prem because if you have a side-to-side -side VPN connection, you can simply connect to your on-prem environment as well. But let's dive into that later on as well. How to connect from your on-prem or your own device? Um, you need the standard, of course, the standard SKU. That's a uh, prerequisite, but um, you can use the Azure CLI. So open up this Azure CLI and you uh, connect your um, tenant, of course, and then there's a command to connect to your virtual machine. And it's using your native client on site on your device to connect to your virtual machines. But the good thing is it's not through a PIP to your virtual machine, it's through the bastion host that you will be connecting. So that's always a good thing. You don't need those PIPs anymore. And it allows you to upload and download files. Um, and it's, uh, it's possible to connect to both um, Windows devices, Linux devices, but also from uh, Windows computers and non-Windows computers. So if you are a Linux guy, you can still uh, connect to your VMs on Azure. Some use cases, eh, why you would uh, want to use Azure Bastion. Um, if you have an Azure environment and there is no site-to-site -site connection or you have no VPN gateway, um, then you can still use Azure Bastion because it's just a path service which you deploy inside your VNet and you can uh, use it to connect to your virtual machines. Um, also, if a jump box doesn't meet your company requirements, so if 2389 is not allowed, even with JIT uh, in place, um, or if it's too expensive, then you can still uh, use a question. Um, also, if um, you have the policy inside your company that everything needs to be SSH um, or uh, SSL encrypted um, using HTTPS, then Bastion is still a good um, use case because it's true uh, HTTPS, so it doesn't use um, uh, RDP or SSH directly to the Bastion host. No, it's HTTPS connection. Also for the management, um, if you cannot use EAS for front-end um, um, front purposes, so everything needs to be through a application gateway or a, a load balancer, things like that. Azure Bastion is a pass service, so you will not be or you don't need to deploy a RDS gateway or jump box um, because it's just a pass service. It's easy deployable. Um, we will show that as well. Um, you can do it to the portal. You can do it to automation. So that's always a good thing. Um, and also if um, you want to have temporary access to the VM, um, you can still use JIT. Um, so we will show that one as well. Even in combination with Bastion, you can still use the JIT option. Pricing. That's always a question that arouses when we talk about Bastion. Um, if you go for a basic SKU for Azure Bastion, you'll uh, end up with um, around 130 euros per month for a deployment in West Europe. I think um, it's around 2,178 uh, South African rent, I think. If that's correct, if I did my calculations okay. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, um, just, just over 2,000 rand per month. Yeah, yeah. Um, if you go for the standard one, it's uh, around 200 euros. Um, so it gets more expensive, of course. Um, but you get all those additional features that you get in, inside your Azure Bastion deployment. Um, also, if you uh, do a lot of outbound data transfer, so you pay for your past service, so the, uh, for the Bastion host, but you also pay for the bandwidth that you use inside the Bastion or from the Bastion host. Uh, the first five gigabytes are for free, and then you pay in tiers. Um, and they even specified if you want to use even more than 500 terabytes, you can contact Azure Sales, which is quite special that you would transfer more than 500 terabytes. I but then again, I never had a customer going over those 500 terabytes. <laughs> so probably it will never happen, I think. Probably yeah. there are some in the world, but so I don't what, know. Um, 
what would be the data? I mean, it's RDP traffic, right? Or yeah. SSH or whatever. But I suppose if you're copying if you have files, 10,000 10, VMs or something running in Azure EAS, yeah, there are better ways to do it. True VMs also. That's another op <laughs> that's another opinion. But yeah, if you have if you're really a multinational, maybe you have thousands of VMs still running and a lot of people connecting all through Azure Bastion, probably at some point you can end up in this number. But that, so, once again, I never saw it. And even I worked for bigger companies. That raises a good question, though. Um, so the Bastion service, I, I saw in the standard SKU that it will scale. Does the basic SKU have the, a limit as to how many users can connect at the same time? Um, uh, 25, 30 session connections. So yeah. And, and it, in, in it, it depends eh? because some people are doing heavier stuff and, and it, it, it's mm -hmm. a flow, but you have some troubleshooting tools where you can easily see if your Bastion host is hitting the limits. Mm -hmm. And then if you're hitting the limits a lot, uh, basically on CPU and memory, yeah, then you have almost no other option to go to the standard tier. Standard SKU, yeah. And then it yeah. scales automatically. Yeah, and then you can start yeah. off with also two and then you can, if you require more, you can simply use a slider or automate it that you yeah, put some other hosts in place. It's quite easy to use. And, and I think if you hit the limits in the basic SKU, you will definitely notice because you are, um, yeah, it's, 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 a, it's a session eh, being copied. So mm -hmm. yeah, you, you will see hiccups and then things won't work fluently. Mm. Yeah. But so, for most companies and people, the basic skew will be more than enough. Definitely, yeah. Um, also keep in mind, if you deploy more scale units, then there is a price for additional scale units. That's why it's so important to use automation. Um, but we will talk about that. Um, thinking about pricing, thinking about when to start using uh, basic standard uh, additional scale units, or even um do a lot more but i will not go into that one we will talk about that though um also the the pricing is different depending on the zone uh, but um yeah it uh, it's case by case maybe a thing we need to mention micha before you do your demo is um azure Baskin is available in the south african data centers we saw but if you open up the azure uh, pricing calculator um, if you look out the outbound data transfer, there is a red X on it, so you can't calculate mm -hmm. it. So I don't know if everybody is using the South African data center, but probably your region, some people will do. Um, maybe you need to raise a question why the pricing isn't showing for the outbound data transfer. It's so, something I noticed yesterday with looking into it because I wanted to be sure that's available in your region. So you can deploy it in those two data centers, but yeah, I think they're so, still working on some things in the back. I've I've seen that on the pricing calculator for things like Express Route and, yeah. and what we do for outbound traffic calculations in the pricing calculator is use because we know that South Africa is uh, considered Quite zone well it's considered zone three which is similar to like the Brazil region or uh, there's some there's some other South American regions that we can compare pricing with so um, I know it's not ideal it's not a, a, an exact amount but it gives you an idea if the calculator is like you say it's broken um we see that in some cases some of the resources okay, yeah. don't have the the pricing information yeah we just uh, want to mention available. it so yeah mm. thanks in most regions it it works and everything shows up but yeah it was the first time i saw a region where not all elements were available i think and um, for the demo, uh, we uh, deployed a small uh, environment, um, quite easy in one resource group. Um, I think this is more visual. Um, we have one bastion hosts inside our hub. Um, the hub is located in West Europe. 
and we have one virtual machine, one Linux virtual machine, which is running in Switzerland North. So it has its own VNet there as well. And one Windows virtual machine, which is running in France Central. So France Central, uh, Switzerland North, they are all VNet peers. So the hub has access to both Switzerland and to France Central, which means that we can use our central bastion host to connect to all our uh, virtual machines. Um, if we would look at our Windows virtual machine first, um, and we use the same way as Wim has already shown, we would dive into the RDP, then it will not work because yeah, we only have a private IP, we don't have a public IP. So connecting to the virtual machine would be possible if we would have a VPN gateway but in this case, it will not work. So what are the other options? We can still use Bastion. And as you can see, it already sees that our VNet, where the virtual machine is deployed in, has a VNet peering to the Bastion host, so we can use our Bastion host. Let me quickly use username and password. Um, a good thing if you are using a a uh, different keyboard, not everybody knows, but Wim already um, described this one as well. We can always change the keyboard language over here as well. So if you are using a non-standard um, keyboard, you can still change it over here. And also the password can come from a key vault. So if you are using a Azure key vault to store your credentials, you can use that um credential to dive into your session host let's connect and as you can see over here we have a rdp connection but within our html5 browser so you need to have a browser which is capable of using html5 and then you just type into your session and then you can start with any action that you want. If you want to start up your server manager or you want to do some configuration or whatever, it's as smooth as you would do for a RDP connection to your session host. It really simply works and it's responsive and it does its thing. Um, now this is a Windows VM. Um, we can do the same with a Linux VM. So if we would go back and go for our Linux virtual machine, we can still use SSH, but it's the same thing. It only has a private IP address, no public IP, so we can't connect from external. We also use our Bastion hosts. The same over here, so we can use a password that we type in, a password from the key vault, or even an SSH private key from a local file, or an SSH again from our key vault. So it has perfect Azure key vault integration. Now let's use the SSH connection. And we are connected to, and this is a simple Ubuntu instance uh, which is deployed. Um, now, I'm a Windows guy, so <laughs> um, I'm very limited into my Linux commands like an ls or a dir. Um, that's, that's all the things that I can do. I think you can even go one up and then that's it. But there's always one little demo that I do, and that's uh, a small curl connection. And so if you do curl and then parrot.live, then you get a dancing parrot. That's always just to show that the frame rate is indeed working and it does does its thing. So you can always do all those connections. So and Matthew, to to once again, if that parrot isn't dancing, you probably need to uplift your uh, scale. <laughs> so that's a good trick. <laughs> So do something with video or whatever, and if it's blurring or stocking, you know, yeah, you don't even need to troubleshoot it. So, mm. um, so Mika, once again, thanks for showing that dancing parrot. <laughs> <laughs> Always love that one. Um, just before but, before taking over, I, I yeah. just wanted to show the 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 sessions, if that's okay, Wim. Yeah. Or, 
Are we even go out of yeah, time? Go on. Do we have some extra time, Matthew? Probably, I think. Sure. Yeah, yeah, Probably. yeah, sure. Yeah, yeah because right. I also, yeah, if you say it's enough, just say it's enough. <laughs> <laughs> you know, we're loving this. Uh, well, I am. <laughs> Uh, so if you go to the, the Bastion host that you are using, um, you will see the, the sessions that are running. Um, so if you want to see how many sessions that are connected at the moment, you can simply see it over here, but also over here. So if you could dive into the sessions, you will see each session to your um, endpoint, but also the target IP and which protocol is being used. But you can also delete such a session. So if you want to disconnect a user, you can simply, I think this is my Linux VM. So if you click on delete, then you will see that my Linux VM is no longer working because over here at the bottom, it says it's unstable. And after a few seconds, you will see that it says that I'm disconnected like this. So you can even manage your sessions from your uh, Azure portal if you are a administrator. Um, and I think the last thing, but uh, Wim will show this one as well. Um, if you are running on a basic SKU, you can go to the standard SKU. So I can upgrade my basic to the standard one, but you can't go back. So you can mm. go from standard to basic, but you can go from uh, basic to standard. And I mm. thought, Wim, that you did some tests and it was quite quickly changed. With, with scripting, mm. it's quite fast, yeah. Yeah. But you see, you now also, when Micha selects the standard, you, you also have those other options you can uh, select. And for example, if you want to connect uh, through Bastion, through your site to site VPN to a VM, um, just know, uh, yeah, probably it will evolve. For now, you can do it on the IP address itself. So if you Put a marker on that IP-based connection. You're able to connect to any on-premise VM through its IP address. If you have a site-to-site -site VPN or Express Drive, Express Drive, yeah. So, and the native client support is another one you can use, like Michael already told, uh, when you're using the standard SKU. And even now, the Kerberos authentication is quite new. So before, um, before uh, all the authentication went through NTLM which is less secure and normally it, the authentication was for older OSs, but now they also uh, put in the Kerberos in preview, so we can also uh, use that one. So that's a little bit more secure and a modern authentication protocol instead of NTLM. So those options, but it's still in preview, so look out if you use it in any production environment. Uh, it works, I tested it out, but yeah, it can change because it's still in preview. So if they do something in the back, yeah. So so the native client is that the the Windows uh, remote desktop client, not the the desktop. Uh, what is it? Remote desktop. What's for by default in in your device? The default yes. one. Mm. Yeah, yeah. Okay. So yeah. they're still working on a lot of things, making extra options available. But yeah, the last months, half year, the day, yeah added a lot of extra features to it, mm. especially to the standard queue. That's why also they yeah, started with the standard queue because the basic queue was quite limited, good for basic stuff, and then just RP and SSH, but all those extra features mostly will be integrated into the standard queue. But yeah, probably some extra features will pop up in the coming months, I think. I think someone has a question for you, Micha. Somebody is raising his yeah, hand. Yeah, it's me, yeah. Uh, okay, so it's two questions on the costing side of things. The the one is, is there a way to suspend it, right? Because it's, a, mm. you know, I mean, it's if I'm running one VM, it costs as much as the VM. I, mean, I know this is like me being cheap. This is not a corporate scenario, but, uh, you know, can I suspend it or is the only way to basically um, some, tear it down uh, tweaks, and build it back yeah, up. There are some uh, blocks, community blocks. Um, I was a thing I was, yeah, maybe I will show it on my screen. Let me share my screen. Let me go to that specific. Uh, yeah. Let's see if yeah, because Michael, you, you're right. You're from completely my observation, correct. It's, you, you deploy it and it's permanently running. Yeah. So it, it yeah, you know, there's no paying. suspend or this anything. This is the thing so, you yeah, were asking, I think, right. Michael. 
So there are some community solutions already written. Um, so mm. one of them is from Parveen. It's an Azure Logic app. And one of the primary things it does is to save your costs. So you don't need to pay for that. Uh, basic, it's 130 euros. So those yeah. 2000 rands. So yeah. if you want, for example, use it just during business hours, um, you also have that Azure function. So what, yeah, you need to integrate it. Eh? So the link is there. Um, you can use that Azure function and maybe um, your business starts at um, 7 a.m. in the morning and they work till 6 p.m. in the evening. So what the function does is build up the bastion itself. So everything is in place except the bastion. It, it builds the bastion so people can use it during business hours and at the end of the day it drops. Yeah, so it will give you a half of the cost, I think. Yeah, because uh, that's like our whole MVP uh, benefit, right? <laughs> yeah. Just on just on best, you know? Yeah. So um, there are some ways. Um, I also did it with the Logic App. I'll uh, test it out. Um, but yeah, there, there are other ways to do it. Eh? Um, I also working on my own thing to do it um, because well, let me go one back. If you want to automate it, um, the links are also there. Um, I created a script which does the complete deployment with all associated resources. So like you can see on the screen, it, it selects a specific subscription. In my case, my management subscription, because that's why it's my hub. It will create all the tags. Um, it will create a Azure Bastion resource group. It will create the NSG with all the inbound and outbound rules required to um, get Azure Bastion working. Uh, because if you're missing if you place an NSG on the Azure Bastion subnet and you're missing one of those rules, the deployment will fail. Yep. And if you change a rule in that specific NSG, uh, your Bastion won't work anymore. Mm -hmm. um, it will also create the Azure Bastion subnet if it's not there. Um, mostly if I do my infrastructure as code deployments through um, Biceps or Terraform or even PowerShell, um, I mostly configure my networking quite in the beginning and my Azure Bastion subnet is already in place. So um, it also creates the PIP automatically with all settings, uh, diagnostic settings enabled. Um, it also places all the tags on it. Um, it starts with the Bastion. Um, the Bastion host deployment itself um, takes around six minutes. So running this script takes around eight minutes these days. Yeah, it's still pointing to 10, but it was eight because I used it yeah, two days ago. Um, it set all, also set all diagnostic settings and um, it even locks the Azure Bastion resource group. But maybe I can show it in my portal. So, um, for example, if I go to that specific resource group, um, maybe it's better we demo with uh, Micha. <laughs> then I will tell all those things. Um, Seeing is believing. But, yeah, so I have my hub. So I have my management subscription. Let me select that one. It, the screen is big enough for everybody. Yep. Yeah. OK, so you yeah. see I have my a specific naming convention in use. I have my Bastion resource group. If I open that one, you can see there is a pip in there and my Bastion. If you click on the pip, you will see it's uh, the standard skew pip. So it's a regional one. You see the public IP address. You can see all tags are in place. Um, if you, for example, go to the diagnostic settings, um, you will see a specific diagnostic, is in, a diagnostic setting is enabled with a specific name, and all categories are enabled, and everything is stored in my Log Analytics workspace. So if you use the script, this will all be automatically. Let me go back one. So I have my best in host. Um, by default, the script um, deploys a basic one because most customers, when they start off and they want to start using Bastion, will use a basic SKU. Um, for this SKU, I already uplifted it, like Micha demoed you to the standard SKU. Um, but basically, if you run the script, for example, it will deploy the basic tier. Um, it will put in place all those tags. Um, it will also set uh, diagnostic settings once again, same naming convention. Um, Bastion audit logs all metrics. Once again, sent through my log analytics workspace, like you can see. So um, all those things are also in place. 
Um, there's also a lock on the resource group itself. So the best resource is inside that specific resource group. So it inherits uh, the lock. Um, and all tax are in place, for example. And um, I think you were asking if you want to troubleshoot the bastion host. So um, when do you know when things, when you need to uplift your bastion host to a standard queue? Um, if you enable your diagnostic settings, you can simply go, um, once again, this is just my bastion host, under monitoring to metrics. You will see you will have some metrics available by default. Um, for example, Bastion communication status, if you open that one and it's showing one, like you can see now, um, this will say if, if one is showing uh, that your Bastion hosts are working, if it's showing zero, there is a problem with the Bastion host itself. Um, the other things you can, for example, look into is the total memory, use CPU. So for example, it's not using a lot. I have a standard at the moment, but if that one is hitting 100, you probably need to add some extra hosts because, um, yeah, probably um, your connections will start showing some strange things. But you can see it's quite easy to troubleshoot it. And once again, uh, oh, maybe also another thing I can show you. Um, if you ever need to troubleshoot, um, your best host is working like it should be, um, but for some reason you can't RDP or SSH to a specific VM. You can simply go under monitoring to connection troubleshoot. You can open this one. Um, like you can see, my subscription is filled in automatically. You can select a virtual machine. Um, you can select a specific resource group in that specific subscription with VMs in there. Um, let me say I have my domain controller one. I select that one. Um, I select IP4, TCP, and destination port because this one is a Windows VM. It's a domain controller, 2389. And you can simply check it. And then it will probably tell you what's wrong in the complete connection. So there are ways to uh, troubleshoot Bastion if it's not working. Um, so don't directly open a Microsoft support ticket. First, see that all those things are enabled and that you can uh, troubleshoot it yourself, for example. Um, next to that, um, probably um, you want to limit, yeah, it's least you want to use the least privileged access model inside of your environment. So you don't want to enable people to have too much access. Um, so for this, you can also use uh, RBAC in combination with Azure Bastion. So if I go to my Azure ID, I will show you. Let me go, just close this one. Um, I have a specific group in place. Um, you can see it, a security group specifically focusing on my bastion. And what the thing is, um, which role you can give some specific role assignments, um, which allows you people just to work with bastion and to connect to VMs. The first thing you need is a virtual machine user login. Um, then you put it at the subscription level. Uh, you need to put that specific user for every subscription where there are VMs in you want to connect to. And next to that one, you also have the you also require the reader role on the Bastion host resource group. And that's it. If you put those two um, RBAC roles, build in RBAC roles into and, and give those to a specific group and you place your um, people that need to be able to work with Azure Bastion in that specific group, they have the, um, the just the access they are required to do their work through Bastion. That's it. That's the only thing they require. So for example, you can see my Legolas user has his part of this specific group. So if I connect with, if, I, if I would log on to with my Legolas user, I will be able to use Azure Bastion to uh, connect to, at this moment, the VMs in my management hub, which are the domain controllers in my management service, for example. Um, and maybe one last thing we can show, Micha, because you mentioned it a lot, um, the combination of JIT and Azure Bastion. So um, let me go to my virtual machines. Um, yeah. You see, yeah, let me select them all. I have some VMs around me of environment. I have some test VMs, my jump VM with that PIP, I connected through with uh, JIT. 
But I also have my domain controller, uh, which has JIT enabled. So if I click on that one, you will see like it should. Uh, it doesn't have a public IP address. It only has a private IP address. So if I now want to connect um, through Bastion, the thing you need to know is um, that you only can request access to JIT through the traditional RDP ports. So the button to request access from JIT in the Bastion window isn't there yet. So hopefully Microsoft will fix that somewhere in the future. But until now, just know it's a Windows frame. Just go to the RDP. Um, you can see once again, this frame has just a just in time access policy. You simply click on request access once again. It's requesting access. It will take some time probably. You can see on the top that uh, my access is approved. And then you go to the Bastion tab, click on it, use Bastion. It will open. Uh, like Micha showed you, it says I am already have a Bastion host in place. Um, once again, I can change my connection settings. Um, let me put it on. So my keyboard on Belgian French. And I can put in my username and a password. And if it's the first time you, you connect, that's maybe something also good that we need to show. You need to allow it. Let me reconnect. I reconnect, probably my JIT isn't already working. Let me connect again. Uh, something wrong. What's wrong? Probably my password. And there it is. So if you ever type the password wrong, you probably end up with that specific error. So be sure to know your passwords when you log on. Or mm -hmm. the best idea is to use a key folder. Yeah, That's don't use the best way to store any credentials in our opinion, but uh, now you see yeah. almost everything, I think. Um, we have one slide, yeah, because we skipped some slides. Eh? I almost demoed everything now. Um, we have some key takeaways I just want to talk about. Um, let me go through them. So we will share the links and then everybody can uh, look into it. Also, uh, for that R back, and um, even to put an NSG on the target VM subnet, you also have specific roles that you only allow um, the Azure Bastion subnet to connect to RDP. Eh? It's a way to even better protect your environment. Um, I have written some blog posts about it. So if you want to read those and you can follow it, it's also with an Azure PowerShell script. So if you need, you need to enable those inbound rules, just run the script adjust the variables to your own environment and that's it quite easy so um i think micha with demoing almost everything now um, we have some key takeaways before closing off um i think five things we really think you should remember about our system of the day first of all um that azure bastion is a path service that you provision inside the virtual network and which gives you a secure and seamless um, RDP or SSA connectivity to your EAS VMs directly. Uh, I think one thing we didn't yet mention, um, we always said uh, you can connect to uh, the default ports like 2389 for RDP or 22 for SSH. But if you're using the standard SKU, you can use your own custom ports. So I know, know some customers that switch the 2389 to another port. Um, if you're using the standard SKU, you can also use those. So maybe also an ID. Um, most important thing when you need, when you use Azure Bastion, you don't need a uh, PIP anymore connected to your VMs. Um, there is only one Bastion host required these days. If you have a hub spoke model, you can even do it between subscriptions. So maybe you have a connectivity subscription where everything uh, connectivity related, like your express route, your virtual, uh, your gateways and all those things, and also your Bastion is inside there. You can act from that subscription. If it's paired with the Venus and the other subscriptions, you can do it from there. So normally you should only require one Bastion host. 
Um, of course, quite important when working with Bastion, uh, try to harden it in the best way you can. So use those NSGs, um, use that specific Kerber setting when it's out of preview. And if you're already using JIT, even combine it with JIT. Um, and then last but not least, we already mentioned it. Um, it costs some money, so keep an eye on your cloud spend, especially if you're using the standard SKU and somebody is just moving around with a slider to put some extra host in place. Know that every extra host will cost some money and at the end of the month, somebody still needs to pay the Azure bill. So um, it's quite important, I think. And with that being said, we also put some references in place. And I think we can answer some questions if you want, if some people still have a question. And if you ever want have a question related to Azure Bastion, don't hesitate uh, to contact myself or uh, Micha. We will uh, love to help you and uh, tell you all about our tips and tricks around Bastion. So I hope it was uh, useful for most people. And if yeah. there are any questions, we would love to answer them. We skipped a lot of slides, but I think <laughs> We, we demoed quite a lot now. So th thanks, Vim and Mika. That, that That's great. I, I I like Bastion, but like Michael mentioned, it can be an expensive resource. Um, so it's it's something you got to watch out for. Uh, it would be nice if there was something that integrated better with JIT where it powers up something or it, you know, it provisions a Bastion host for you once that access has been granted and then powers it off again or you know suspends yeah, it. Yeah, some way of automation is uh, yeah. Mm. Uh, I understand. Just to but, say yeah. but kind of like uh, and Mika, you would understand from an A V D perspective, have some kind of auto scaling. Indeed, uh, yeah. Auto provisioning <laughs> um stuff. But um yeah from a security perspective, it's it, it's something that you should be looking at. Yep. Otherwise, you you're going to be putting something else in place that's going to cost you a lot of money. You know, if you're using cyber or you're getting rich, and, eh? like and that. that will probably or you're gonna cost, cost you a lot more. of more money. I think exactly, so. Exactly. It's it's yeah. it's you don't yeah. get the overall security for peanuts. Eh? That's the thing we always right. say to customers. Um, yeah, you need to pay uh, something to uplift your uh, security posture or to better protect your environment. Um, even Putting all those Microsoft Defender plans, like I showed, if you put them in mm -hmm. all, all of them, yeah, I think for every server these days, if you have uh, Microsoft Defender for servers enabled and you have the server plan too, um, it's $15 for each instance. Mm -hmm. So if you have 100 VMs, you need to calculate 100 by yeah. 15. And, and yeah, th there are some different plans in combination, but for example, if you want to use JIT, it's plan two, you can't use plan one. Um, mm. A few months ago, the, there were even no plans. So you had the free and you had the payable one. But yeah, Defender yeah, almost switches every two months. Mm -hmm. Yeah. <laughs> First of all, the name switches. Eh? So everybody needs a new, new name. And then mostly they change all the billing behind it. Mm. But yeah, that's the thing you see a lot with a lot of Azure resources and features these days. So, uh, but yeah, that's true. No Azure Bastion, they're still working on a lot of stuff. So, mm -hmm. probably, hopefully, there will be some way to easier automate it. By now, uh, I do a lot through that script. I also have it in a bicep now, which, yeah, for me, a Bastion deployment is just yeah, eight minutes, the time it takes to spin up a host because in the back, there are still some VMs being that need to be enabled, but they're just managed by Microsoft. That's the difference. Mm. So you don't yeah. need to be take care of it. That's that's, that's yeah. Good. So the best way for people to start out with Bastion would be to deploy it through the portal um, and and see what it does, what it yeah. what resources and, and it creates. Definitely just start with the basic SKU. Don't put yeah. on so if you have a Visual Studio subscription with the $130 limit or something, yeah, 
spin it up, test it out, but don't let it run because it will mm. probably you don't get by the end of the month before all your money is gone. Yeah. And um, so the really the only limitation with the base SKU is that you have to go through the browser based client, right? Yes. So you're not using Correct. a native client. Um, but you know, you're getting the security that comes along with um, you're connecting to your resources through a secure jump server. That's, you know, yep. jump server sure. as, a, as a service kind of thing. You're not yes. opening all those ports publicly on public in, uh, IP addresses. So uh, just by doing that, you're securing, yep. you're adding security. And it's, it's, it's the best way to connect to your VMs, in my opinion. Yeah. And yeah. don't say yeah. it's the cheapest way. That's another thing, but it's the most secure way. Yeah. Mm. It's super fast. Yeah. If you deploy an environment and you don't want to use public IP addresses, but still want to manage them, it's super fast. In five to eight minutes, you have yeah. an RDP connection to your session, to your host mm. and to your VMs. But and so. and that's that's actually another good point is if you're deploying a bastion host in let's say South Africa but you're connecting to resources that are in other regions it's using the Microsoft backbone to connect yeah. to those resources yeah. so you have yeah. that that lower latency it's not yeah, yeah. I mean and we, we're I always concerned if, about latency I don't know if you saw it but the VMs I was connecting to all were using different SKUs eh? so I even had a B series VM and had a D series VM and I don't think you saw anything different in the way it acts when you connect to it with Azure Bastion mm -hmm. so even that if if you set it up correctly in the way it should be set up with everything in place like the NSGs with all the roles in place yeah, it just works but despite that I still see a lot of customers struggling with it but that's mostly because it's not set up in the way it should be set up mm -hmm. the appearing is not okay or um they forgot appearing their RBAC roles aren't in place uh yeah whatever but if it's correctly configured and deployed it it works without any hassle in my opinion and it just works so mm. cool well thank you guys thanks uh, vim and mika thanks for uh, coming and showing us that um i I want people to ask questions, but people are being very quiet, even on the <laughs> chat. <Yeah. laughs> uh, Thomas did say thing. you want to pay in tiers for Bastion, not in uh, tiers. I think uh, uh, <laughs> if you do go through all our slides, if you do this live, the thing we see, a lot of people, ah, that's the way you do it. Ah, OK, uh, not that they don't know about Bastion, but yeah, we put those NSGs in place, we put those RBACs in place, and that's most people just deploy it and leave it like it's being deployed and don't yeah, optimize it or configure mm -hmm. it like in a secure way and stuff like that. So yeah, that's the thing we see. Yeah, we try to cover all topics of that specific resource. It's not the most complicated one, so I don't think there's a lot more to talk about around Bastion than the things we now talked about. So no, no. I guess you've answered everybody's questions just <laughs> by talking. So, so thank you, um, Alistair. You don't have any questions? <laughs> Not really. Uh, uh, when we look at at accessibility into into Azure and, and what that world looks like. Um, we're starting to see a lot of customers going, oh, this is great. Uh, everyone goes through portal.azure and, and we never look at what your security posture is and, and, and what that world means to, and then people ask, well, how do we get access? And a lot of times customers don't look at uh, Azure blueprints or anything like that, or proper landing zones or looking at standards like PCI or even the ISO 27001 with apps and services, which gives you that, that holistic view into how spoke and, and, oh, but we've got a firewall. Why do we need Bastion, right? Um, and, and, and we're starting to see organizations understand what security actually means with the amount of people that are getting hacked. Every day, some other company has been hacked. It happens, yeah. right? And security posture 
is is a thing and people don't know what's available because where do we come from right bricks and mortar if i can pull the network cable out of the back of the server i i, I stop the hack right that's always you know in case of uh, in case of hack break glass right then pull cable um, so so it, it is new for, for customers to understand, even if they are doing some form of, you know, and customers go, well, we've got VPN into our network and then we've got Express Route into Azure. Um, it, it, it's still not it's still not best practice, right? And and with things like you might have a firewall, but you need Bastion and you need some other ways of getting in and VNet isolation and network security groups. For me, it's still uh, your hub is important and make sure that your your DMZ um, uh, in the old days. By the way, another it. thing, because you're talking about the hub and the Azure firewall. Um, yeah. The Azure Bastion subnet shouldn't be routed to your firewall. Otherwise, mm. it won't work anymore. <laughs> it's separate, right? It's, it's like an important that. factor. Like I, think, I think we didn't mention it, but mm. that's one of those subnets you just leave alone, put an energy on it and leave it like it is. Don't put any mm. routes on there because it will stop working. We guarantee it. Yeah. Even the same if you have private DNS zones in place, um, it works together. Mm -hmm. If you don't use the default ones, there is a complete list from special names you can't use because otherwise your bastion won't work anymore. But that's our more architectural uh, decisions you need to look into before you start deploying it. But yeah. I think most people don't have a lot of private DNS zones in place these days. So some probably and probably those who, who are already using it will probably know which one can conflict or whatever. But but that's I think for me it's always about make sure you understand what you're doing and yeah. plan for it, right? Yeah. Mm. But it, it's yep. great that, that that Bastion exists and it's cool and it sounds great and, and and the two of you make it sound so simple and easy to configure and these are the considerations. But but I understand how Bastion fits into into your larger virtual yeah. data center design, right? Um, and and that's what a, a people just think. Oh no, yes, Azure migrate. I'm going to click a button or I'm going to yeah. ASR and and my stuff's going to run there, right? And then if I put Express yep. Root in and I do some routing table stuff, my people can access it, right? Great. Um, and they never look at at, at just a secure score or even a standard like ISO or NIST or uh, Matt's favorite one, CIS, um, when it comes to, to securing your environment. Um, applications don't secure or platforms don't secure your environment. Um, configuration does, right? And enable some extra features and configure it. In the way it should be configured that's the other thing but yeah we, yeah. we, we also see it in our day-to-day -day work a lot that uh, you know, some azure environments are up to uh, improvement in, in in different ways not only most, security governance most. wise all of the other things it's it's yeah you almost can write books every day if you visit any customer environment and this can be better this can be better this can be better this can be better and yeah if most of the time it doesn't stop. But it's 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 a continuous evaluation, right? Yeah. And a lot of customers yeah. think that Yeah, that we, we click can... or we just push it through ESA and that's it. Uh, no, that's not how it yeah. works. Yeah. And also customers they 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 are com maybe compliant customers, they've been compliant to certain um, standards on premises and those mm. standards have up, have been updated to include cloud so there's the processes and things that companies have been doing for years everything must go through firewall etc cetera, etc cetera. things need to shift a little bit because of cloud and how things are working um and that's not to say you must now you know relax those standards or relax those controls the controls are just different now um and the tools that you use to implement those controls are are there and more readily available, like Bastion. It's it's a tool to implement a control, in my view. Yeah, the thing is, and I think a lot of people are thinking about it in the wrong way or implementing the wrong ways. You have your on-premises features, don't apply them the same way into Azure because it will probably end up 
very badly at the end. <laughs> well, what you do is you restrict the the agility that is supposed to come with cloud, right? Yep. So you 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 start you have all of these things in place that you had on premises that just slow things down, or there's uh, it makes it very hard for people to deploy resources or um, you know developers they can't access resources because they're they're not being given the ability to do so or whatever so the it, it just slows things down which is the opposite of what we're trying to achieve yeah. when adopting cloud the whole point of it is the flexibility and the agility that comes along with cloud so um but you've got to have those guardrails and yeah. the, the things Completely in place agree. so uh, I have to jump to another meeting because. Uh, <laughs> yeah, no, no, cool. Another meeting Likewise. is popping it's up. It's lunch time. <laughs> yeah. No, 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 it's still call time. <laughs> now over here yeah, it's lunch there. time. It's, 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 it's fall, so. It's midday. So, um, so. What I can do, Matthew, um, yeah, you saw all those QR codes with those uh, blog posts. Maybe I will put them on a list into the mail and maybe if you upload the video, you can add it in. Uh, mm. And then people, if they want, they can just look at it. If they don't want to use it, yeah, also, it can, it can help great. them if, if they want to use it. Yeah, yeah. It can uh, make another alternative, a if, if you're up for it, is uh, sharing the slides. But yeah, yeah, we'll you. share. I will we'll share. No problem. Cool. Yeah. Cool. Then you see we had a lot of more slides, but yeah, I, I almost demoed so, it all. So Cloud Fridays yeah. actually has a LinkedIn group. So um, if you want to join the LinkedIn group, then we can share yep. stuff on LinkedIn. Um, obviously, YouTube, we're going to upload the video. We've got to yep. first process it, and then we'll do that. Um, so yeah, the, we want to continue this conversation. Obviously, we don't want to end it here, but we understand that everybody has uh, day jobs to get to. Um, well, most people. Alistair's <laughs> at home. so. I've I've got a call now, and so are you, Matt. You are also oh, at home. Right, yes. I've actually got a call now. I'm the one that's usually <laughs> physically involved, but I've got true, a call true. now, gentlemen. Thank you so much yes. for your time. Yeah, you're welcome. Thank you very much. Thanks. Yeah. Thanks for coming. Thank you. To everyone soon. And yeah, we'll chat to everyone soon. Thanks, everyone. Bye bye. Bye bye. Bye bye.